It would have broken his heart to see his woods and meadows divided by the river Nysa, to observe border fences blocking access to them and restricting the view, and to witness his aristocratic legacy administered by a socialist government. All he had expected were chattering spinning wheels and smoking chimneys. Moscow Park was Prince Pukla's heart, the mirror to his soul. The high art of horticulture could be compared with music, just as fittingly as architecture has been called frozen music, so horticulture could be called vegetating music. It too has its symphonies, adagios and allegros. Located in the far east of Germany, this region had always been rather remote. And that was also the case in the 18th century, when the rather coarse Count Pückler from Cottbus married an extremely young Clementina von Kallenberg and her inheritance. The barony of Muskau in Lusatia was rich in ironworks, foundries and subjects. But Pückler and his wife were very different. And their union was not a happy one, nor was the childhood of Hermann, their eldest offspring. He became the enfant terrible of refined society between Berlin and Dresden, and a favorite of the ladies far beyond the borders of Germany. He traveled the world on foot and in elegant carriages. He wrote books that were praised by Goethe and Heine, and he presented Muskau with an English landscape garden. In his park, the prince played every role himself. He wrote the script, produced and directed the work. Guiding people's steps and their gaze in organized nature by means of a stage-set landscape. In 1815, Perkler brought these ideals back from a sojourn in England. His aim was for prosaic strollers of the day to read his writings on landscape gardening in order to perceive the grand vision of which the fields, forests and meadows were all part. Paths are the stroller's silent guides. Their purpose is to enable him to freely discover every delight. Bends are subject to certain artistic rules of taste, and at times obstacles first have to be created to preserve the most favorable line in a way that seems natural. In his smart uniform, Pückler caused quite a stir. He once appeared on Berlin's Kudam with a team of stags. He never missed a chance for a duel or for a liaison. And an attempt to fly high in a balloon saw him land in a pine tree in Brandenburg and go down in literature as Baron Münchhausen. Well over 2,000 acres of the land I needed were the property of individual citizens or village communities. The huge losses I suffered over many years, through war and other unfavorable circumstances, meant that I could only progress slowly. If that were not enough, the land nearest to the palace consisted of nothing but infertile sand and rock-hard clay. When I began to demolish the municipal road, Several people truly wondered whether I had lost my mind. Hookler wanted to shape the Nysa Valley and its citizens according to his vision. 750 hectares of unspoilt nature for people who were free. Artificial lakes and hills the orchestrated wild growth of trees, a sophisticated system of fields of view, 
controlled nature the perfect illusion. It takes time and a truly guided eye to marvel at a project between magnificence and megalomania. It means walking to and fro over the paths and noticing how the perspective changes. There is nothing petty about this park. Indeed, it is far more a grand gesture. The Second World War and its aftermath cut through the lines of view and drove out the free spirit that reigned here. It was only after the collapse of the German Democratic Republic that Poles and East Germans began to cultivate the divided park together. Since 2004, the old twin bridge over the Nysa has been open again. But didn't Pukla himself suffer through particularism, the drawing up of borders and changing rulers? Pukla attracted poets, singers, statesmen, philosophers but also travelling people to what he regarded as a far too remote corner of the earth. The old class order dined here, as did the aristocratic members of the Prussian opposition. Reformers and romantic daydreamers alike allowed themselves to be courted and duped by the enigmatic prince. They revered him and they made fun of him. The only sure things about this host were his extravagance and his persistent financial difficulties. Even though she was not yet divorced, Lucy, he hoped, would remedy the situation. Lucy was Countess von Pappenheim, née von Hardenberg. At the age of 32, the Don Juan from Lusatia asked for the hand of a woman who was nine years his senior. To be honest, when we married, she was truly in love with me, but by no stretch of the imagination was I in love with her. I told her quite plainly that I saw our union as a marriage of convenience and that I reserved the right to conduct myself with every conceivable freedom. And yet, it seems to us, it was a very special marriage, documented in a lifelong exchange of letters. My dearest lamb, my powder keg, my beloved sweetheart, my lady commissioner. Lucy continued what her restless spirit of her husband had begun. She was the constant in his life and in the park, and could only stand by and watch as together they consumed her dowry. With hardly a penny to his name, in 1826, Pukla set out for England. Not because of its gardens, but on account of its ladies. A new match with a woman of means would he hope clear his debts. In a heart-rending letter, Lucy granted him his freedom. As Count Smalltalk and Lord Fortune Hunter, the German dandy enriched English literature. At dinner parties and on trips the length and breadth of the country, he gathered impressions which he shared with his Lucy in Moscow in a daily stream of letters. After three years, Pukla returned, without a wife, but as an author. Lucy had turned the reports of his travels into a literary work. Comprising several volumes, the work was entitled Memoirs of a Deceased. In it, a philandra who is very much in the land of the living talks about English ladies, the impoverished nobility and parliamentary democracy. Spicy passages fell victim to Lucy's censorship. In ultra-conservative Prussia, the letters gave rise to rumour and served as a source of amusement and for a while at least, they were a financial success. I can scarcely remember an artificial island which did not betray its enforced genesis at first glance. Only recently, for instance, in the Royal Garden at Buckingham House, I found one that looked more like a pudding bathing in a sauce than an island formed by nature. But the era of grand parks was now over. The drawback with our art is that, unlike a painter or an architect, in landscape gardening, we're not capable of creating a work that's complete. Our creations are in constant need of a skilled guiding hand. Fortunately, in Moscow, that guiding hand was never completely absent. Even in GDR days, Eckhard Bruch, 
looked after the land on the German bank of the Neisse, but he could only look on as nature took back the park on the Polish side. Today, something that belongs together is again growing together. And Eckhard Brooks, who recently retired as park keeper, is thrilled by every line of sight that is opened up again, and every path that is re-strewn with gravel. And he's delighted at the unbelievable ease of crossing over from one bank to the other. Young people from Poland and Germany are working on the park together as part of a project designed to combat unemployment. And the park's incorporation into the world's cultural heritage is a joint success for the two countries. After watching 30 years of rampant growth, he was powerless to stop. That must have been a wonderful retirement gift for Eckhard Brooks. A dream palace in a Lusatian Arcadia. Like many a flight of fancy, Schinkel's concept remained a vision on paper. But Puckler fulfilled his dream of traveling to the Orient. In 1834, he set off on a journey that was to last five long years. And this adventure, too, was to fill books with tales that could have come straight from a thousand and one Arabian nights. Accounts of hunting giraffe, sailing on the Nile, crossing the Atlas Mountains with 4,000 warriors, and a beautiful little slave girl. But that's another story. Back home, for the first time, good old Clementina was furious, while Pukla squirmed and could only look on as the exotic child sadly died in a foreign land. Because of Makbuba's nature, I was able to bring up this sweet foster child for myself and myself alone, just as an artist creates his ideal painting exactly as he wishes. We sense this republican-minded aristocrat amongst the trees. We seem to see the image of this vain Casanova and self-critical spirit shimmering in the waters of the Nysa. And we feel the presence of this generous and profligate patriarch on the benches. Indeed, in Moscow, many roads lead to Pukla. Pukler had 800,000 trees and 42,000 bushes planted. He diverted the Nysa, resettled a village, built bridges and sank a fortune in the park. To Lucy's great sorrow, in 1845, Pukler sold Moscow. Together, they settled at Branitz Palace near Cottbus which he had inherited. Although Branitz was intended as a place to spend old age, Pukla could not rest. This tireless spirit set about creating a new park. 